The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, so morning, everybody. Um, my name's George Kenny. I'm a systems engineer for Veeam Software. Thank you for joining today. I appreciate it's a Friday morning, so uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, I hope. It's better than doing a technical uh, webinar on a Monday morning for sure. Uh, we've got quite a few attendees um, and maybe just give it one more moment before we start. Um, there is a dashboard here that shows me that uh, we have people live. You're all on mute at the moment, okay? If somebody wouldn't mind just uh, raising their hand, there's an option to raise your hand to make sure that you can hear me and uh, see my screen as well. There's a um, uh, raised hands, fantastic. Okay, so loads of raised hands, which is good. So I'm hoping that means you can see our, our screen here, maxing out performance, uh, deliver extremely fast processing with Veeam software. So the, the audience for this would typically be technical. It would typically be people that are maybe familiar with our Veeam software. Maybe you are musing, uh, coming on board with Veeam and starting to use our stack. Um, if you haven't used it before, then this won't go totally over your head. There will be some sort of general, new, uh, you know, are we touching in general sort of IT terms, networking, storage, all those sorts of things. So it should be easy to capture what's going on. And also for those of you that are very well versed with our, with our software stack, hopefully there's some good stuff in here that will give you that that deep dive experience you maybe want to to capture out of it so still got a few more people attending um, I'm hoping that um, they will be able to catch up with where we are because I don't want to delay this it's Friday morning like we say so we shall proceed um, my details at the bottom there so at Veeam we advocate obviously our community being able to contact us so my Twitter and my LinkedIn profile there for you to use and abuse I am a systems engineer. I work throughout the UK, so I know this is an EMEA broadcast, so we may have some um, non-native uh, English-speaking people joining. So I'm hoping my accent isn't too, uh, too deep and that you can understand me clearly. Um, so without further ado, let's proceed. Um, now, just to cover off some groundwork, this was actually a session that was initially delivered at Vimon. Um, earlier in the year in May by Peter Makarov and Vishalev uh, Kuz. Net so um, my pronunciation is probably not correct there, but I really am standing on the shoulders of giants here. You know, these guys have put this stuff together. They know the technology very well. So obviously I, I am in their wake, if so to speak. And we'll also be delivering more sessions like this at our Veeam on virtual, which is the HTTPS go veeam.com, blah, blah. Just Google search Veeam on tour virtual. And that are some sessions that we're doing later on the year with loads of content from sort of like our key speakers. So that might be worthwhile looking out for. Again, you can join that. Our CEO will be on there talking about the vision for Veeam, so on and so forth. So just some, some groundwork there straight away. And like I say, this is a technical um, presentation. So to be honest with you, we're going to dive straight into it. There's going to be no niceties here. Um, there's going to be four chapters to it. And the step one is going to be looking at Veeam backup and replication settings. OK, so I'm just looking at attendees. Um, we have um, excellent. We've still got people staying, which is excellent. Fantastic. lot of people this morning. So uh, let's move on. Um, just start my stopwatch to make sure we don't overrun. OK, so. We're going to dive straight into this. Um, I'm going to cover off a couple of the global parameters you can see within our software. We'll look at maybe some of the more granular settings as we move on throughout this. Um, the first one I want to take a look at is the use of multiple upload streams. So again, if you're familiar with our software, you may be familiar with this and looking at the sort of file, uh, file option within our software stack, top left menu. Uh, one of the key global settings we can configure when sending backup or replica data between two locations is to enable multiple streams. Now, this might be relevant if you have adequate link speeds, perhaps on a campus link or maybe over a wide area network. But if you're suffering with latency, then this can be a challenge. So by default, we set this to five concurrent connections, but you may want to bundle this operation to reduce load between those two points. Uh, so bear that in mind when uh, exploring your network. Maybe there's a network team that you need to consult, uh, consider other contending services that we share between those particular geographies within your environment. Maybe you don't have a dedicated backup infrastructure link, so you need to be conscious and vigilant of other applications that are sharing that, that bandwidth, okay? Um, and then you can tune that in here to, to match the needs of your environment and other uh, sort of applications you're sharing with. So in short, be aware of these global settings. We do see people missing them. Um, I do see backup admins tinkering with these values, forgetting they've implemented them, walking away, 
and maybe perhaps the link speeds have been upgraded in the future, the network team uh, further down the line, uh, you know, you're still uh, throttling these criteria. So bear that in mind um, throughout, okay? Um, just double checking we are um, in business and we are, that's good. So, um, and the next one I wanna to talk to you about is storage latency control. So now again, I'm showing you an interface here of how you actually access this. Again, this is a global setting again. You can configure this to be more specific around the individual data stores. This is all about adaptive backup, okay? So we can tune the speed of our software actively. Um, so we have a couple of values in here that you can see. Firstly, we can see that we can prevent additional jobs from being loaded into the engine if we match certain criteria that you specify. And equally so, if we meet the second value, potentially higher criteria, then we'll actively slow ourselves down to restore performance to the other applications without stopping the backup job. So this is ideal for testing. Consider you're trying to detect maybe whether the backup is impacting a particular service. You can run Veeam in a very light mode, okay, and see if it's had any negative impact on any production uh, that might be living within your environment. And you can customize that on per data stores, okay. So again, these are global settings. We're going to go a bit more granular as we walk on through this. I see a few people have joined, but we're not going to go back. You haven't missed much. Um, job settings. This is where you get into the meat and bones of, of actually what we're doing here. Okay, so um, with the job settings itself, uh, there are some under the hood settings you can explore depending on your use case for Veeam. Um, if you go into the job settings and hit advanced, um, you'll be able to review individual change block tracking settings for each job independently. So these are not across the whole of your estate. They're specific to the individual job when you configure them. And you really can go quite granular with this. So the two hypervisors we support today are VMware vSphere ESXi and Microsoft Hyper-V. Both have their own independent variant of managing change blocks. And we at Veeam are trying to operate in a delicate touch approach to every operation we do. So it's important for us to leverage CBT tool sets the best we can to ensure we don't have to traverse too much data over your network. So CBT allows us to capture that first full backup, okay, so that heavy bandwidth backup or, or on protection copy, if you like, and then only transport the changed blocks, hence the name, to our backup target on the course of subsequent backup operations. So this, of course, in tandem improves speed of our incremental backups, making our operations far faster. So you need to potentially consider resetting CBT, particularly if a VM is failing or a job is failing at the same point, perhaps say into the first two or 100 or 300 meg of the job, and it's a continual thing, keeps failing, keeps failing, keeps failing. This might be an indicator that we need to reread the entire data set again, okay? So remember, as with any backup platform or third-party tool that is leveraging features and APIs native to those two hypervisors, we are somewhat at the mercy of these providers and the tool sets they provide us. So if you are in the unfortunate situation where you do need to reset CBT on some of your VMs, then rest assured the actual error codes we throw up to you in Veeam job settings actually clearly specify this in plain English. So it makes it nice and easy. In most scenarios, we see customers enabling CBT across VMware and Hyper-V. It had to be a particularly uh, unique use case scenario, to be honest with you, if you want to disable this feature. Um, but it's good nonetheless that you know it's there and what its purpose actually is. Okay. Now, again, looking at the two different stacks here, the software here on the left is for VMware. If you have a VMware license on the right is for Hyper-V. So you can see there's a slight couple of uh, sort of tabs uh, differences because the technologies on those hypervisors are slightly different. Um, you'll notice on the right hand side that we have this feature which is specific to Hyper-V, allowing us to essentially group VMs together in a Hyper-V snapshot. And it means we reduce the need to create multiple snapshots at the hypervisor level, which as you know, is, an, uh, is essentially an overhead. Each and every time we conduct a snapshot request to the Hyper-V host, it adds overhead. So when this option is chosen, you'll see a significant improvement on the behavior of your Hyper-V hosts and the underlying guest virtual machines and provide you with a far more centralized source for capturing backup data. Some of the key requirements for this are that you need to have those guest VMs living on the same host, okay, at the moment the snapshot is taking place. And for server 2016, uh, you also need to configure an off host operation. So in a nutshell, you must be using the Hyper-V server as the source proxy for the backup job. You need to have another server running the Veeam data mover service. So you can't install a software into the Hyper-V box that's, that's hosting the VMs. So 
that's number one rule. Number two rule is the, the VMs you're taking a snapshot from need to be on the same host. So look at the affinity maybe of your VMs. Maybe you want to bundle them together per job, wherever it may be. But that is a very powerful tool set to use if it's used in the correct fashion. We'll move on. Um, we have a couple of questions in the in the um, chat window. I'm just gonna have a quick look at them now. Um, okay, I'm seeing them. What we'll do is we'll probably review them towards the end. If I see any that are particularly pertinent, then I will answer them there and then. Um, so in today's world, uh, November 3rd, 2017, we're currently uh, GA on Veeam Availability Suite 9.5 Update 2. Bear in mind that Update 3 is very much on the horizon in the next few days slash weeks. So if you haven't upgraded already um, from maybe an older version, dare I say there are people still here using version seven, but I know there are people out in our field using version eight. I was talking to a customer a couple of days ago, very big estate, big upgrade process, planning it, all the very various things I need to plan around upgrading the Veeam stack. Um, but you know, think about getting up to uh, a newer version sooner rather than later. Some of the things you'll see that have been added to version 9.x are um, proxy affinity, I often see out in the field customers configuring their proxy servers. Uh, just to quickly explain what a proxy is, it's the thing that drives our workloads. Uh, and that is to uh, now centralize a simple deployment that's, that's um, well, basically bear in mind that our, our VM, Veeam software is acutely aware of all the proxies we deploy because we use our software to actually distribute them. So uh, by default, we will use any proxy that's available. So you may have a case that a proxy is close to the source of the VMs and applications that it's protecting. But obviously, if you let that go automatically, it may choose a proxy that's maybe in another WAN location. So you're going to be traversing that network traffic across a wire. So think about the location of your proxies and pinning them or using proxy affinity to actually uh, tighten that, that, that workload or to a close, closer proxy to where the VMs reside. OK, so particularly important for customers that have a, a, a scaled out architecture. Uh, parallel disk restore, another great option is the addition of, um, of this. Pretty much does what it says in the tin, allowing us to read data simultaneous streams during bulk restore operations. As I'm sure you're not surprised, moving data around a network, irrespective of whether this is production or backup process, is a bandwidth intensive operation. And to add insult to injury, if the data requested is having to initiate sourcing those blocks of data from a sporadic and haphazard areas on the network or on the disk silos, it's conducted in what we called a random read process and performance you know, significantly degrades. So what we're actually doing here is creating a map of the data streams before restore operations commence. And then when we read those blocks from files from our backup data, we can essentially sequentialize these or essentially sequentialize these, it's a tongue twist for that, and stream it in a far more graceful and efficient mechanism. So added to this is the, the parallel processing, which means that we can conduct this in a more simultaneous VM backup repo, making it really significant improvements on RPO types, okay? Uh, broker service, I'm just gonna run through these very quickly. Basically allows us to create a mirror of the, of the source environment infrastructure in memory. So if I take this to, you're using Veeam, you're going into the infrastructure, you're adding VMs in, you normally have to wait for us to consult vCenter or Hyper-V, come back to you, load the library. It's a bit slow, okay? So what we do now with the broker service, we actually load the inventory and the library of data from vCenter, map it into to Veeam directly, and we're doing that regularly. So when you're navigating throughout the Veeam interface, we've actually got all that loaded it into directly into RAM. So we're reducing that IO chit chat between Veeam and vCenter because we have that all locally. And we're just, you know, irregularly consulting vCenter for an update on that. Um, things we're going to cover off, fast synthetic, RFS, um, advanced data fetcher, SQL, lots of improvements added to latest and greatest versions of SQL to our support stack, better understanding of the store procedures and uh, common language runtimes. So in a nutshell, a whole host of reasons to consider upgrading to 9. something 9.5 update 2 is where we are today so um, yeah bear in mind always have a vast array of features being thrown down the wire a few more questions coming in but I will get to them at the end um, now detecting bottlenecks so just to cover this off what we're going to do is uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper here into the product talk around our integration with both VMware and Hyper-V how we can improve uh, general deployment scenarios. Maybe you have what I refer to as a next, next finished installation. 
nothing wrong with that. But sometimes little or no thought has been given to the common interaction we'll have with the infrastructure and the network we're ultimately dependent on. Um, and in these scenarios, we also uh, need to be uh, appropriately designed around reducing uh, the bottlenecks throughout the environment. So uh, we need a logical and successful way to detect those, those bottlenecks if they do present themselves. So touching on uh, VMware, first of all, if you're a Hyper-V customer, don't lose heart. We'll be touching on Hyper-V in a moment. And most of this stuff is largely transferable between the two stacks. Um, so we can see on the left, we have our, our hosts, which typically have some form of data store attached to them. We don't need to get too distracted by how that looks at this early stage. But it could be a primitive block level SAN. It could be NFS or DAS, vSAN type technology, OK? And then we have a Veeam server in the middle, which is running either as a physical server or a virtual machine. That, that works fine for both of us. Uh, maybe it's even a VM that lives in the same VMware host uh, that we're protecting that from the VMs that, that are actually on the same box. Uh, could, could be that. It really doesn't matter. And then we have one of the key components of Veeam, which is the Veeam proxy, which I touched on before, responsible for processing the job, going to consume bandwidth, consume resources, uh, conduct um, you know, deduplication and compression on the fly. So so this is really the muscle of our software. We call that the proxy service. And you can see there's a source um, proxy uh, target data mover where we move that to our, our backup jobs, which we refer to as the uh, target repository, which is typically a disk. Okay. So on the left, you'd have your SAN, your primary storage. On the right hand side, you'd have your backup repo. You tend to see customers having maybe slower um, less feature sets in their backup repository because it is ultimately a backup architecture. Okay, nothing to say it can't be something that's glamorous. Maybe it was, you know, moved down the environment later on from when you didn't upgrade in your primary stand. Who knows? So, um, looking at job statistics is one of the key things we can take a look at. This is in the GUI, so it gives you a very augmented view. Um, when we go into the actual uh, uh, software, we can actually hover over this for both VMware and Hyper-V, and we can look at things uh, such as bottlenecks that are presented to the GUI. So source, 99%, proxy would be the proxy service, maybe it's running out of CPU or RAM, network, maybe the network HBAs are being saturated, and the target would be that target repository. So if you're using a very cheap and deep NAS, maybe some, some clunky drives, maybe 512E drives, 6 terabyte, 8 terabyte, you know, they tend to be slow. OK, so you might find there's some latency or performance bottlenecks there. I personally like to see the source uh, being the biggest um, bottleneck because typically your SAN is normally going to be enterprise class, going to be designed to deliver uh, enterprise class storage, uh, fast uh, connection at the back end. So if you can get it that sort of sort, not, this is particularly uh, overweighted, this particular slide, 99% is maybe not true. But, you know, think about getting your source to be uh, the, the, the bottleneck here. So that if your SAN is the, work, the working hardest, it means your proxy, your network and your target are all chilling out, which is where you really want to get to. OK. So um, some of the bottlenecks we can actually detect throughout the modes that we use, uh, there's basically four different modes we can use to transfer data. And I'm just going to cover those off uh, loosely because they will present some troubleshooting and some, some enhancements that you can look at throughout your environment. So if we take a closer look at this, MBD mode, often referred to as network mode, stands for network block device, is the most Commonly used, probably the, is probably the default. Well, it is the default mode that we that we have uh, enabled out of the box. Um, and the M network mode really isn't considerate of any other sort of network types. You know, it, it knows the network's there because it's talking from Veeam across the network to VMware to Hyper-V, and it's aware of that network. And it's basically going to use the network that's presented to it using the the VMware kernel stack to move data throughout it. So it's probably the easiest set up to deploy but also probably some of the challenges you'll find are storage read performance so we're adding another service request into those source data stores uh, the hyper-v host or the hypervisor uh, host load you know we, we're utilizing the vmware kernel stack and of course we're consuming bandwidth on the resident network traffic so essentially the network pipe where all the other applications and your production network are living so yes it works nine out of ten ten customers MBD mode, or I'll probably say seven out of 10 customers, MBD mode is normally typically fine. Their network isn't saturated, saturated enough and is, is able to deal with the additional throughput. But it's worth considering the trade-offs when you face using MBD mode, um, like those those three bullets that I've, I've got there. Okay, so um, I think there's a Wii animation on this. 
Um, if I actually lift up the GUI interface, this is actually the screen you see when you go into the GUI. Um, automatic selection will go and choose it. I don't tend to use auto selection. I normally specify what I want. And you can see down the bottom here, we've actually got network mode is actually ticked as a failover. So if you choose one of the other modes we're going to get to in a minute, network mode can be your backup route to make sure that if you have a problem with maybe one of the transport mechanisms, then you can fail over to network mode. Rule of thumb, I would say network mode, please try to consider using it on 10 gig infrastructure. You know, we, it can work on one gig, but at significant cost, okay? So um, let me just move forward. Um, hot add mode, okay? So uh, hot add mode is a great tool set to use uh, with inside VMware. Um, it's probably the sexiest method we have as we're using some of the very intelligent feature sets that are provided by VMware uh, and maybe some more of the geeky or technically savvy Veeam users will want to experiment with hot add mode as it's on-demand connectivity. Oh, audio connection has been lost. Um, just double checking that um, I haven't lost connection. Bear me one second. Bear me one second. Okay, I'm on the web. Um, can I get a show of hands? If uh, hands raised, if you can still hear me. Oh, great, great. Okay, I got a, a pop-up saying that, um, yeah, that's great. Thank you, everyone. I got a pop-up saying my audio disconnected. So um, yeah, from my personal experience, um, it's probably the method that's faced with the large, largest amount of configuration issues. Um, so you need to pay particular attention to um, some of the configuration environments uh, that, that hot add will will prevail with you. So um, uh, if you had 10 VM hosts, then you'd need essentially, or if you had 10 uh, VMs you're trying to back up, you need to have a, a hot add server for each one of those. So situated on the physical hypervisor. Uh, hot add mode needs to live inside the virtual stack. And, and what I actually missed talking about all together here is what hot add mode does is it mounts the disks to a virtual appliance. You can see that on this graphic here with the sort of spinning spinning sort of looks like a router sort of square with a spinning arrows um, that it mounts the the disks in hot add mode from vmware to our appliance and then we back up the data from that so there's a lot of technology going on in the under the hood hence why it's pretty cool but obviously uh, just bear in mind that, 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 that it's quite tricky setup and you just need to keep an eye on how how well it's performing with your environment okay so um you know, we are at the mercy of VMware and the technology that lives inside this to leverage this sort of technology. And you can see that the network um, performance disappears with this. So we're still using storage read performance. We're putting load on the host because we're using technology with inside that. We have to, because it's a virtual, a virtual mechanism, uh, but we do negate any impact on the network. Moving on, um, probably my personal favorite and preferred transport mode is direct storage access. If designed in the correct fashion, provides a very fast, efficient, um, and minimal load in your environment when implemented. In short, we virtually bypass most of the host processing here as we have no need to conduct the transfer operations through the VMware kernel stack. And instead, we present the LUNs or volumes or, or whatever you want to call them from the SAN directly from the, the back end of the storage to the Veeam proxy server, okay? So you, there's, a, there's a guide you follow and you map them to the, to the disk manager within the, the Veeam proxy server. So you can see here in the triangle at the bottom, we have a connection from our Veeam server to the storage. This would typically move data throughout the hypervisor to transport it. But in direct storage access mode, we actually uh, we're actually able to channel that data from the SAN directly to the Veeam proxy, okay? So you'll notice we still have a penalty on the SAN read performance, and that's, that's physics. You know, we need to read data. <laughs> it's never going to go away. Reading data is uh, sadly a, a necessary evil when we're dealing with backup, <laughs> sort of the point of it. Um, and uh, then we have uh, the addition of load, albeit on the storage fabric, directly to the uh, uh, directly to the proxy. So we're not actually loading resources onto the hosts or the network. We're putting all that load on the SAN architecture, okay, which is good. So it goes back to the argument of whether you want to use MBD mode. Remember in that last screen I showed you where you had the tick? Um, a lot of best practices will say use that as a failover mode. My personal preference, which isn't a Veeam preference, is to actually leave that unticked because if you have an issue with the direct um, SAN access mode or direct storage access mode and you've got failover to MBD mode ticked, you might not notice that you have a problem in your environment. And obviously your backup still work, albeit 
a little bit slower, a little bit more latency on, on the other applications. Um, but to you, you'd probably think they're fine. So I actually prefer to know where my backups fail because maybe somebody misconfigured a HBA, maybe I've lost access to the storage where some of the volumes are, maybe the ACLs change, who knows? But I want to know about that. So I actually prefer, if I go back a couple of screens, I actually prefer to, uh, where was that screen image that I had? There we go. I actually like to untick failover to network mode. Okay. So, but obviously part of our, our premise at, at, at Veeam is to obviously make sure we always get a successful backup. So it's your choice. My personal preference is to untick that because I want to know when I have a problem in my environment and then I'll remediate it. So it's up to you what you want to do there. Um, I think I've covered off that with direct storage mode. Uh, final one, um, and that probably is the creme de la creme, is storage snapshots. So very similar to direct access storage, the main difference between storage snapshots and a snapshot created at the hypervisor is that with a storage snapshot, um, we are able to capture the data from the actual storage snapshot that lives within the SAN, as opposed to a software snapshot that I refer to it within the hypervisor. So side by side, on the left-hand side is what I consider a hypervisor snapshot. And the trick with this is that we have to wait for the backup process to complete. So that's the, the blue block. Uh, we have to wait for that to complete. And uh, then we can consolidate the snapshot, the red, the red line. Uh, on the right hand side is the storage snapshot route, which is what I could refer to as hardware based uh, snapshotting. And you can see there, we still have a snapshot that lives within VMware. You will actually see within the VMware task manager at the bottom that you'll actually have uh, a snapshot being taken for about three or four seconds because we need to still capture VSS application consistent backup. Okay. And then obviously what we do is we send that command down into the storage architecture. So this is like backup on steroids okay and we have to have special integration with the particular provider so netapp hewlett packard all these labels at the bottom are the are the people we work with today a few more labels coming down the wire but is a significant improvement if you have applications that are 24 7 or high io um, dependencies this is a game changer in terms of actually getting a really successful backup fast okay um, just to show you that screen again, this is the, the tick box I wanted to allude to. I've already covered that off, so let's move ahead. Let's talk maybe a bit more now about detecting problems within our environment and perhaps troubleshooting them. Uh, we do, of course, need to resort to some more in-depth techniques, or maybe perhaps your environment hasn't necessarily got problems per se, but you wish to ensure that it's all running optimal and you want to do some diagnosis to eke out any bottlenecks that might be lingering, and of course, optimize every single part of the system. As the saying goes, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So one of the key criteria I often see out in the field, um, let's just go back a section. Uh, one of the uh, key criteria I see out in the field is um, detecting problems at the source storage, or, or probably better to say, a misconfiguration at the source storage. And that might not necessarily be the SAN, it might just be that you have uh, some in, in configurations or misconfigurations with the, the fabric, you know, the, the devices that sit in between the SAN arrays and your actual hypervisors. So, you know, you might not have a uh, link aggregation protocol set up correctly. You might have some spanning tree going on. You might have a, a port that's misfiring, so on and so forth. So all of that can give a, a, a knock on effect to um, all right, I'm just getting a message that the sound is not good. Um, so Elvira, is it um, still um, still not a great sound on the particular channel that we're talking over? Could you Skype me and let me know if um, the quality of the call is any good? It's no good. Is it? Is it glitchy? Is it? Okay, it's good now. Okay, please let me know if it's no good. Um, so I'll just move ahead. Apologies if the sound is a little bit sketchy, people. Um, apologies for that. Um, some of the metrics we want to look at, um, ESX Top is one of the tool sets we're going to explore here. Um, uh, so, you know, if you're familiar with that, we can actually explore some of the commands. Uh, D commands are represented in time on the device, K commands, time in kernel, uh, G is guest, so on and so forth. Uh, but if we get down to the bottom here where we're looking at things like IOPS, latency and disk queue depth, I think these are sometimes some of the easiest things we can actually look at. Now, IOPS are sometimes a little bit more tricky because there are loads of factors that can 
cause IOPS to e either be shown as being particularly favorable or particularly bad. But two of the easiest ones to actually report with the environment are latency and disk queue depth. So disk queue depth, if you think about going to the shopping market, uh, supermarket, and you're in a queue, you know, you're, you're, you're you know, three deep, you're third in queue. So you have to wait until you're served at the checkout. Okay. So in storage terms or in, 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 in um, you know, servicing IO terms, same principle applies. So you really want to look at making sure your disk queue depth ideally is always zero. We don't want to have any any uh, 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 queues within your storage waiting to be serviced. And the other one is latency. Very easy to to monitor this. Uh, ideally, rule of thumb is you want your storage latency speed to be under 20 milliseconds. So a lot of tool sets available within VMware and Hyper-V to detect that, report it. And then once you've got those two criteria uh, knocked out of the park and you're happy with them, you can start looking at things like IOPS and getting a bit more deep into it. But those are certainly two of the most easiest ones to, to touch on, okay? Now, uh, just a, a quick screenshot of how ESX Top looks. If you haven't seen this before, this will give you, uh, it's actually a tool set you run within VMware. And you can see here all those different values at the top, like DAVG, CAVG. They also tell you the sort of like throughput that's going on the particular kernel. Um, so uh, you can use this as a, as a tool set to, to see what's going on. Um, this is actually one I loaded up from my, my environment. You can see here that um, you know we've, we've dived into, uh, uh, if you press D on your keyboard, it will show you the HBO mode. If you press L, it will show you the LUM mode and, and give you the individual reports you're detecting on, on, on those particular uh, elements of your environment and show you all the different um, components. My, my, my lab, as you can see, is, is very quiet when I was running this, no, no transfer rates whatsoever, but a really handy tool to use. Um, one of the nice things you can do to it, uh, it, it do with it is capturing data. So if you, if you run batch, uh, batch mode, uh, uh, switch D for delay, number of iterations, so it, you know, two, two iterations every, every second uh, for 100 seconds, so you get 200 seconds worth of, of stats. And then you can drop that out into a CSV file. Um, now, this might seem all a bit magnanimous, but the reason why you might want to do that is you might want to load the output of this into something that is maybe more graphically favorable to you, something like visual ESX tops or ESX plot. Uh, you can use the native sort of performance charts within VMware. They're OK. I'm not a big fan of them myself. Um, but again, if you use ESX top to drop out uh, a chart, over a period of time where you know there's a problem within your environment or maybe someone's complaining that at a certain point in the day there is an issue, drop that out to a CSV file, load it into whatever your preferred GUI is, Perfmon, whatever it may be, and then you can read that data and, and actually analyze it against different benchmarks. So really handy tool set to use. Um, moving forward, um, Hyper-V. Um, once again, the design uh, scenario here that we most often see within a hypervisor stack is Veeam sitting as either a VM uh, Veeam sitting as within a VM or on a physical box. Okay. Uh, now, all of the roles um, typically are deployed into Windows, and it's it's a luxury we have with Hyper-V because our software deploys to Windows. So when you're running a Hyper-V environment, you can actually run our software on the same virtual host that's servicing your 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 environment. Now, there may be reasons why you want to do that, but there may be reasons why you may want to avoid it principally because we'll add additional load for Veeam processing to the servers that are actually running your, your virtual machines. So the main difference here as opposed to VMware is the proxy role actually exists on the same box as the Hyper-V box. So um, when we're actually backing up a Hyper-V host, we can actually install our software into a, a, a separate Windows box called off host mode. I think that actually might be shown on this. Yep, off host mode. And um, this will allow us to move the Veeam processing onto a separate um, Windows platform. If you've got data center licensing, you could spin up a virtual machine or maybe a physical box and actually run that as a, as a processor separately. So the Hyper-V hosts remain uh, relatively quiet around how that processing works. So, um, one of the things, if you are running Hyper-V, it's actually a tool set that we provide to you as a Veeam customer. You don't have to actually be a Veeam customer. You can download it uh, completely free of charge from our website. The Veeam Task Manager of Hyper-V, it's a very nice tool set. Hyper-V has some limited um, monitoring tool sets, um, but the, the particular tool set we have 
for Veeam, uh, it gives you some really nice top-down views, um, has the ability to look at um, individual hosts, clusters, heat maps, storage. Um, you can isolate individual VMs and look at them, transpose them, and you've got some reporting features in there as well, which is really nice. So free tool, download it from Veeam, um, gives you some, some performance analysis in there for Hyper-V. So some of those tool sets is a very rich um, uh, community of, of support tools for v, VMware out there, not so much for Hyper-V. So feel free to, to use this, this particular tool set. It's worthwhile looking at. And as we're talking about bottlenecks, I want to move on now to talking about compression. So um, as you can see here within the particular job itself, you'll go into the actual storage option within the job and you can select individual compression settings. Now, by default, we set this to optimal, which is a fair grade, and we will get a, um, a dedupe and compression ratio of about two to one. Okay, so 50%. So if you've got a 10 terabyte data footprint, we're going to save that down to about five terabytes on disk. Okay, so it's not bad, but it ain't great either. Now you can increase or decrease the compression that we will apply, but obviously um, that comes with a slight trade off in terms of how much load we'll put on your environment, how much time we will take. If you are particularly sensitive around compression and get an enhanced compression, you can tune us up, okay? But obviously as you do that, the job will, will take longer to complete and will consume more CPU cycles. So you've got that luxury there to do that. Um, I think as we move forward, we'll talk about dedupe appliances in a moment, okay? And, and one of the, probably the, the biggest things that I see in terms of configuring your environment is actually setting the amount of concurrent tasks. So within this particular example, we've got a job set with concurrent tasks against the actual proxy. So this is again, the proxy engine. So we're saying the concurrent tasks that can run within this are two. Now we map the number of tasks against the virtual disks we're processing. Okay, so I might struggle to explain this properly, but if you think about a virtual machine that we're backing up, okay, and that virtual machine, let's say for example, has two disks, two virtual disks, so it's got a C drive and a D drive. If we hit it and process it with this particular proxy that has two concurrent tasks, we'll process both those disks in tandem. Now, if we add a third virtual disk to that virtual machine and back it up again, what will happen with this particular proxy here, because we've got two concurrent tasks set, is we'll queue the third disk. It won't process until the first two have completed. It doesn't mean that it will be out of schedule because we take the snapshot at the same time. It just means we're going to leave it on the snapshot within VMware Hyper-V until we can start processing it. So think about the number of virtual disks environment. Forget virtual machines. We don't care about virtual machines. We care about the virtual disks you're, you're backing up. OK, how many are you? That's the main metric we want to consider ourselves. I've, I've heard people citing the number of sort of like think around 30, 40, 50 virtual disks per proxy. I've seen more than that being run quite successfully. Um, larger disks obviously work nicely for us because we back them up in bulk. So think about virtual disks and mapping that to your proxy settings. The next thing to consider yourself with is, um, I'm just checking my sound is good, and I think uh, Elvira is telling me it's good, which is nice. Um, the next thing to consider yourself with is that when you increase that value, because you think, well, hey, why don't I just increase it? You can do that. But we appropriate the number of um, streams you can run or, or, or concurrent tasks you can run against the number of cores that are available within the proxy server. So if your proxy server was physical, for example, the maximum amount of, of actual cores you could allocate is the amount of physical cores or actual virtual cores, I should say, living within the, the CPUs on the motherboard. OK, so if you had two CPUs with five cores each and you crank this up to 11, it would come up with this warning and say, hey, you haven't got enough cores. So you need to think about three things here, or actually four things. You need to think about the number of cores with inside your, your server or VM that you're processing this on, the number of streams you run and the number of virtual disks. OK. And moving on from that, let's just go forward. The target is actually the repository. So you might have multiple proxies. You might have four proxies with five concurrent streams, okay? And they're backing up virtual machines at five at a time. So the combined um, uh, value of all those proxies writing to a repository, which is a target, would be 20 streams at a time. Now, we don't have a warning sign on this because your repositories, you can actually crank up quite high um, because we sequentialize that data, all right? But ultimately, when you do that, um, 
Um, just think about the number of proxies you've got, how many streams you're running, and where that target is going to be in terms of what's hitting the repository. Okay, so you want those numbers to be all in line. I, I do hope I've explained that properly. If not, throw a question at me at the end. Now, typically we don't have the luxury of specifying our servers when we're actually delivering this. Maybe you've got an estate you've inherited, but if you are buying servers or configuring servers out of the box for this, uh, then bear in mind the number of cores available to you because at Veeam, we care about the cores available. So in this particular server spec from one of the, the main uh, retailers for hardware, we can see we've got highlighted an Intel Silver, uh, Intel Xeon Silver 4108, 1.8 gigahertz clock speed, but eight cores and 16 threads. So that is relevant for us. The eight cores and 16 thread is really relevant for Veeam. Okay. Now, if we move forward, what I've done is I've highlighted the one below as well, which is actually 2.1 gigahertz, but we don't really mind. Yes, clock speed is important. Don't get me wrong, but actually that has got the same amount of cores and threads available to us as the box above it. And it's more expensive. OK, and if we look down the bottom as well, we can see here as well, we've got one with 12 cores, 24 threads um, at 2.1 gigahertz clock speed. The one below that is 2.3 gigahertz clock speed, but has the same amount of cores and threads available to it. So those are the values we care about when we're deploying architecture. And if we take this guy, he's actually got the highest clock speed. So, yeah, great. He's got 2.6 gigahertz clock speed. He's actually more expensive than the one that was initially se selected, but he's only got four cores. So actually, he's probably the worst CPU to select when you're building your architecture. So, again, think about how you build your servers, what you're configuring. If you've got the luxury to build your environment, cores are important to us. And we're seeing Intel and AMD issuing uh, cores now in, in, in silly figures. OK. So um, moving on, uh, we're going back here to uh, global network traffic rules, very similar to what we had before. As the name alludes, these are settings that are applied to the entire network, all the jobs, total configuration. Fair to say that when you go into the global network traffic rules, there isn't a granular setting. This is something typically apl gets applied depending on the makeup of your environment and the elements uh, on the Veeam site deployment as a whole. So you need to have a good visibility of your infrastructure. So in here, you can see we have some source and target IP networks. We also have the ability to specify multiple upload streams for those independent networks. So it might be relevant if you have non-production network, or maybe a dedicated backup link as we talked about at the beginning. And we also have the ability to toggle encryption uh, that will be in flight um, if you choose to throttle our network between our, our traffic between independent network lanes uh, and what speed you actually want to do that at. So, uh, you know, keep an eye on this. Um, if you're doing backup copy jobs and replicas and you, you, you set us to go without putting anything in this, we will go pedal to the metal, if so to speak. But if you are wanting to, uh, at say eight o'clock in the morning, schedule this to actually throttle us a little bit and maybe reduce uh, the aggressive nature that we're gonna run, then this is where you would go to configure that and, and actually uh, plonk that in there. So from a troubleshooting perspective, don't forget that that's there because I have seen customers uh, using those uh, values, playing around with it, and then, um, you know, six months later, they're wondering why their, their, their bandwidth is slow um, because they, they've left these settings configured. So they're global. And we can specify the networks and the subnet masks as, uh, as the GUI suggests. So uh, this segues, segues us nicely into WAN acceleration. Um, this is um, a great bit of technology we have within our software. Um, you know, it works very similar to something like a riverbed, if you've seen anything like that. We, we basically cache the blocks of data and then we save them into a digest or a cache at the peer end. OK, so by default, when you enable uh, by default, the global cache uh, for Veeam is configured to 100 gigs. Um, uh, however, you can crank this down to a bare minimum of 40 gig if you if you wish. Uh, general rule of thumb is rule of thumb here is the larger the WAN cache, the more efficient our protocol becomes as we're able to store more of those repeating blocks into that directory. Of course, if we see new data traverse the network, then those repeated blocks are saved into the WAN global cache folder. And equally so, if there are some data signatures that have not been evident for several days or weeks, then Veeam will you know will expunge those from the cache between the, the, the two sites. So it's worthwhile bearing in mind how important WAN acceleration will be within your environment. Again, so we're just caching that data. We're, we're software, so we're not doing anything like uh, flooding the TCP line. Um, we, we're doing this all in software. And it will only work for, for Veeam traffic for both backup copy jobs and replicas. 
Now, if you're using this technology, the general rule of thumb is to think about the number of streams times 1.5 against the link speed. So if your link speed, as highlighted down here in green, is uh, 10 megabits, then think about using 15 streams at a time throughout the WAN accelerator. SSD was a prerequisite before, but we're saying now that's not absolutely necessary. I would still say that if you have SSD in your environment, that is a really good uh, place to actually store the SSD cache for uh, the, the, the WAN uh, global cache because it will be very pokey for us. So uh, if you've got SSD, provide that to Veeam in terms of that 400 gig, 500 gig for that, for that cache at both ends. OK, and if you go to the best practice guide for Veeam, we actually make some loose suggestions here about uh, data at the uh, source WAN accelerator. So digest size equals 5% of the provision VM size. So as the as the BP suggests, if you plan to process 10 VMs um, with a, a combined size of two terabytes, then you must allocate 100 gig of disk space for the digest data on the source WAN accelerator. And equally so, we make some loose suggestions around what you should do at the target WAN accelerator. So the digest size equals 2% of the provision size. So the bp.veen.com is a really good uh, place to go to, stands for best practice, and it's got loads of suggestions in there about things you should and shouldn't do. Um, but yeah, general rule of thumb here is that if you don't have enough capacity for the WAN accelerator cache or digests, then you'll get sporadic performance. And because we consult the link speeds during the backup copy job, uh, then WAN acceleration performance will be degraded and uh, we'll just transmit the data using TCP IP. Okay, so make sure you take a close look at those values. Now, in terms of backup modes, this is all about what we do when we're backing up uh, VMs. I can see we're running a little bit late on this, so we're at 40 minutes. I'm going to try and rattle through these last, last slides. Forward incremental mode, this is where we take a full backup and then create subsequent incrementals. So we have a payload here of one IO per block. This is on your target repository. Um, this is very common. We see a lot of customers doing this, uh, seeing a lot of active falls being created throughout your environment. Um, and uh, moving on from forward incremental uh, is uh, reverse incremental mode. This is a really good bit of technology, but bear in mind it has a higher impact on your storage because what we're doing is we are impacting the, the disks um, at the target after the backup job is complete. And we're rolling that into a full backup file. So if you look at your backup repository and sort by date modified, you will see the most recent file is the largest one because we shunt all of the most recent data up to the last file. So you don't have to worry about the incremental blockchain. Okay, blockchain, where am I coming from with that? So incremental chain. Um, and then forever forward incremental, probably my favorite and the one that I see quite a lot out in the field at the moment. This works very similar to uh, forward incremental. The difference here is that we're not going to create um, uh, active falls at any particular point in time. So we're just going to have, um, you know, a, a full backup. And then however many days you want to run your backup for, we'll just create incrementals. And then, say, for example, if you're doing 20 days worth of backups on the 21st day, we would actually shunt the first backup to be the second file get rid of the first file and then you'd still have 20 files on your on your on your backup repo so um, this works really well if you are fighting capacity because you're not having to store multiple falls and we have some health checking with inside our data set that allows us to make sure that incremental chain is indeed healthy okay general rule of thumb here is if you're doing um, sort of your backups maybe one two or three months retention this will work fine because we're not having to rely on a full backup. If your retention is something like a year or two years, this is not for you because having a long chain with no full backup is not a healthy approach, okay? And then moving on, synthetic falls. What this ultimately allows us to do is take an incremental, okay? And then what we do is we transform that incremental at the end of the process and transform it into a full backup. So we're not putting the load on the network, we're not putting the load on the storage, we're putting the load on the target repository and we're merging, merge is the wrong word, but we're essentially what the, the ultimate upshot of this is we merge the files together that creates essentially a full backup file at the end. So this is great because we take away all that impact on the environment, all the, the bandwidth in your estate, the production environment has completely ignorant this is going on, but ultimately we do this post process, okay? But it is a, if your storage repository is 7.2K rotation drives, uh, you know, six terabyte, eight terabyte drives, RAID 5, this is, this is gonna be a very 
busy process. It's not gonna be sensible for you. Now, moving on from that, what we can do is leverage something called REFS, uh, which is Resilient File System, okay? Um, this is actually a, a newfangled file system from Microsoft. It was actually released in Server 2012, but never really cut the mustard. However, in Server 2016 edition, it has a bit of a makeover and provides us with some really advantageous benefits. Uh, first and foremost, REFS provides the server OS to deliver SAN-like capabilities. Now, if you're a SAN guy on this webinar, you probably shoot me in the kneecaps for saying that, but ultimately it means that REFS has the ability to understand blocks, block data, and block pointers. So we're getting very SAN-like qualities from the file system, okay? So that's a very quick synopsis of what REFS does and actually what we're able to do there. Um, because those data blocks already exist, if we're doing synthetic falls, we just rely on REFS to point to those blocks. So we're not having to do that synthetic full process on Veeam. We just use the file system to do it for us. So um, one of the considerations to have is REFS uh, has a very high consumption of memory. That's one of the things you need to consider. Check out, again, uh, the knowledge base articles on Veeam. That goes into a little bit of depth around best practice for RFS deployment, but we're seeing a lot of customers adopt this uh, in on, on storage repos these days to benefit from improved speed and reduced capacity on those repos. So I've just done a few screenshots here. I'm going to rattle through this very quickly. Size on disk for the backup file is 175 gig. We can see that here highlighted in red. And the free space is 122 gigs on the actual disk. And we can see that's labeled as REFS. We can see in the job that we've actually identified the RFS is processing. And we've detected that from the, the file system. It's been passed up to our file system. And then in here, we can see that the full, full backup file, which was a synthetic full backup, but the, the upshot of it is it's just given us that .bbk, is 178 gigabytes, okay? Now, if I move forward, we know that file is 178 gig, but in here, we see that the free space is 122 gig on the disk beforehand. Once we save that file down to disk using REFS, we now have 120 gig free. So we've actually only burnt two gigs worth of data, but we've saved 178 gig to disk. So the file system is presenting to us a fully healthy file, 178 gig, but the file system has actually only burnt up two gigs of data. So we're utilizing all those similar blocks on the disk. Or oh, say we're not, Windows is, they're, they're doing all the hard work for us, okay? So consider RFS and how much of a benefit this can be to you in your environment. Backup file uh, fragmentation, you can suffer from uh, backup file fragments. This is, uh, isn't is something that's isolated just theme. It's a general problem that prevails when you have multiple streams, many file creation source waiting uh, or writing to an isolated um, single file. Uh, the workaround for this is to consider options within Veeam such as per VM backup, as the name suggests. We create a single backup file for each VM you back up. So 10 VMs, you'll get 10 backup files. Um, the downside of this is that when we negate uh, that we negate any of the benefits of having, having cumulative uh, dedupe and compression. So you need to consider whether or not you want to use per VM backups or when you're trying to reduce any corruptions. Um, and also you can perform maintenance or compacting operations. Again, it's a couple of tick boxes in our software. It will go through on a schedule, look at your backup files, see if there's any um, maybe bad blocks, and then we'll actually merge the data blocks from the neighboring day's backups and then repair that backup file. So again, you just need to configure it and turn it on um, and run it maybe when the backups aren't running. Um, but it's certainly worthwhile considering for making sure your backups files are healthy. Uh, this is a step on for ARM REFS. REFS from Microsoft is stepping on the toes of these guys. These guys provide out of the box um, dedupe uh, appliances. So EMC, Exagrid, HPE, uh, great boxes for long term retention. If you're storing data for sort of upwards of two, three, four years, then you will get. I mean, I, I said earlier that Veeam will get almost a two to one compression ratio. With these, you'll probably see something like a 30 to one compression and dedupe ratio. So it's massive um, in something like a two or three year appliance. So really high uh, payloads on, on your backups. And uh, there are some best practices to follow if that is of interest. Uh, Elvira will be circulating these slides after the, the session. So you can have a look at using best practices for Microsoft dedupe or dedupe appliances. There's also a Veeam uh, KB article for that as well. Uh, benchmark tests. Um, 
One of these uh, that I particularly like is iPerf. It's a free tool you can download. It's open source. Um, if you're running this tool set, uh, depending on the particular scenario with your environment presents, you can run some common standard uh, command scripts, which will engage a standard routine operation within Veeam and then report on the overall performance. Okay. So if I just run that for you, um, you can see here that we will run through the actual operation, compare the results. And if you follow that, uh, just run this particular animation for you, you run iperf, you run the particular script against Veeam, it will run a standard set of values. Okay, let's just run it, let it run through the animation. And then what you can do at the end of this is you can compare the, the result of this against our benchmark tests that was on the previous slide. So you can actually run that and see what that provides to you in your real world environment, or I should say in the wild, against what we've done in maybe a lab or in a best practice deployment. So if you're getting those similar values, you know you've, you've got a good metric. If you're half, then you know you've got some things you need to look at. So it's not diagnosis, but it's telling you that there might be some improvements to be had. Another one is VIX Disk Lib or Virtual Disk Library. Uh, works really well with uh, MBD and Direct SAM mode. Um, so again, works in a very similar uh, scenario. You'd, you'd follow this link at the bottom. You'd, you'd capture the benchmark tests for read and write that we pr prevail. And um, if I just show you how that actually works, uh, we start the Virtual Disk Library. And if I run this, you can see it drops out our sample run it from its particular bin folder. And what you'll see here when it completes, you can drop this out to a file if you want. You can see here that we'll actually, oh, I think that, that animation's finished quite quickly there, but it shows you that at the end, we got to nine megabytes per second on that particular workload. So you can compare that against our benchmarks to see if your environment is working healthily, all right? Um, let's go run that again. Let's forget that. You've seen it. Okay. Um, some other tools for benchmarking, some Linux targets. I, I'm not a Linux guy myself, but uh, it's there for you to use and abuse if you are uh, so like in that way. Some data domain um, tool sets that you can utilize and also uh, some um, HP store once. This is the store once uh, dedupe appliance. So you can get this from Veeam support. Just down, get them to provide you the software. Gives you a health check report on your HPSO for, for dedupe. Um, and session summary, um, we're just going to cover off, um, you know, the sort of pillars that we've covered off here. Perform your basic checks, detect the bottlenecks within your environment, uh, run the corresponding benchmark tests and compare that against our benchmarks that we published to the web. You can just click on that link within the slide deck and then collect the uh, performance data with the support team. So uh, what you can do here is send that performance data to our support team. They will look at it. They will actually analyze what's going on with inside those logs and let you know if they're detecting any signatures that maybe don't look particularly healthy. I would just add to that the support guys at Veeam are great. Uh, they are, however, support. They're not a design consultancy service. So we have a very strong uh, community with our partner community that are fully up to speed with VMCEs, VMTSPs. Uh, that's their job to make sure your environment is designed and deployed in the right scenario. So if you have you know, particular design uh, problems within your environment that's maybe been spawned from day one, the support team really can't help you with that. They can give you some clues, but it's not really their job. Their job is to, to fix the problems, maybe do bug reporting if there's any bugs you're detecting out there. Um, so if you have problems with the design, that's where you need to liaise with the SEs, like myself, or your partners, so the people you buy Veeam through, because they've all got the various medals and uh, certificates that they, they are up to speed, their engineers are up to speed with how the Veeam technology works. So I do apologize, I rattled through at the end there because we were overrunning a bit. Um, I'm just gonna flick open the questions for anyone uh, that might have uh, flicked up. I apologize that the questions are written in a particularly small font. So I'm having to stick my specs on and have a look at what's been written here. Um, excuse me. What is the best practice for a proxy? Concurrent tasks, how many virtual CPUs for big VMware clusters? So yeah, I would say that, um, you know, the rule set I, I cited earlier was looking at, um, you know, the virtual disks as opposed to the VMs and go with the vibe of sort of 30 to 40 virtual disks per proxy at a time. I would say um, that that's probably fair. And if you find you're getting good performance, then um, by all means, uh, increase that value against your environment, okay? Um, I'm just trying to open the question panel. Um, I don't think I can see any more questions in there, to be honest, guys. Um, can this be sent to me? Yep, um, we can send the slides over. Elvira will do that. Um, 
can I use the WAN accelerator skip IPsec tunnel for backup copy replication? Yes, you can. So the WAN acceleration is for backup copy jobs and WAN acceleration only. We won't accelerate backup jobs, okay, um, out of the box. That's one of the things we won't do. And um, if I moved down, audio is gone. Sorry, guys. Somebody said audio had gone. I do apologize. Maybe my internet connection was poor. Um, somebody from Kent. To implement REFS, uh, we need to have a repository target. Yes. So to implement uh, REFS, you basically need a Windows server that might be virtual and then mounted to your disk repository. So when you format those drives, like you do within Windows when you have a disk, you just choose to format it, format it in REFS. But I would say make sure you do that on server 2016. The latest version of REFS is version 3.1. So do embrace that because um, that provides a significant improvement. Um, is it possible to migrate the backup infrastructure from a Hyper-V host to another server? Um, we have a migration tool that basically takes on all of the, um, um, I guess if you're moving from Hyper-V cluster to Hyper-V cluster, then yes, we have a migration tool. It, it takes all the um, identities for the VMs and maps them into it. Um, the question I would have is, can you upgrade uh, your Hyper-V host and add new host into it? That would probably be the most sensible route for that. I hope I've understood your question appropriately there. Um, we've still got people joined, which is good. So I'm just going to go through these questions, make sure. This is good for implementation if we are changing repository. What is the best practice for proxy concurrent tasks, I've answered that. Uh, we have uh, 10 proxies, 10 vCPU per proxy and 40 concurrent tasks. I think that's just a statement, but that sounds pretty good. Um, the thing to bear in mind is the proxies, the, the rule of thumb is if you can deploy proxy roles to physical servers, that is a really good practice. And you know we are a virtual company, so we fully uh, accept that you may want to deploy proxies into virtual scenarios. That works just fine. Um, the problem is there is that you are sharing services, whereas when you deploy us into a physical architecture, you uh, we have the ability to absorb all of those resources, all of the memory, all of the RAM, et cetera, et cetera. So that works really well for us. I'll just open up the question panel so I can see that far easier now. Um, uh, has audio gone? A lot of the questions here about audio. I do apologize, guys. Just checking out any other questions. Um, audio is gone. Is it possible? Great. Um, uh, file level performance, file level recovery performance dips massively when more than 10,000 files are selected. The GUI actually locked for me. Okay, so that's from James. James, uh, if you want to reach out to me at the end of that, it's george.kenny at veen.com. Um, yeah, it looks like, uh, you know, we should be able to do that with the broker service. The GUI shouldn't lock. It'll be interesting. You are obviously doing quite a large uh, number of um assign a staff member to, I think somebody's asking to answer this question. So, um, uh, you are storing quite a lot of files there. 10,000 files by, by any stretch of imagine is is quite a lot. OK, any more questions, guys? Because um, I think that's all the questions come through there. Um, does anyone want to shout out any more questions that you might have? I think we've got most of them. So, ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate your time today. I know it's Friday morning. I hope you have a good lunch. and. Um, I will hang around on here with Elvira uh, for a few more moments in case there are any more questions. But again, really appreciate your time and any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I will just flick this back to the beginning slide deck if you want to capture my details. Um, end slideshow, let's just put this right back to the beginning if anybody wants to uh, slideshow from beginning. There's my details if you need them. So yeah, please do feel free to call me if you need anything. All right, thanks for the comments, guys. Very nice presentation, Morton. Thank you very much. Yes, the slideshow will be shared. Um, uh, Derez, uh, apologies if I spent uh, uh, pronounced your name incorrectly. Um, Kent person, you're still going 10,000 file restore, copy the data from C drive, it works fine. All oh, right, okay, fine, so you're telling me that. Oh, another another question here. So uh, we're experiencing significant issues. Um, I'll just open this up. On Hyper-V based platform, we're experiencing significant eight to 10 second pauses with VSS snapshot on backup, very noticeable to users environments such as Exchange, extra step of the host side VSS. So yeah, with Exchange, think about deploying DAGs. Um, we 
tend to like backing up passive DAG nodes because you can appreciate exchange is quite sen well it's not sensitive it's a reliable application but you know because they tend to be big um, think about deploying a passive DAG node and backing up the passive DAG node so we don't stun the exchange environment we don't have um, the ability to capture storage snapshots for Hyper-V. It's only a VMware feature. So, um, Elliot, if you, you are suffering with that, then consider a passive DAG node. Uh, if I've not answered that question, then uh, please feel free to email me or put another response on here. When we back up a file server, this is from Philip. Uh, when we back up a file server that holds user profile disks on for an RDS server, we notice that the sessions get disconnected. Is that normal behavior? So this might be to do with maybe the stunning when the snapshot tries to consolidate. Um, Philip, I'd be interested to see if um, if that is a uh, Hyper-V scenario or a VMware scenario. Obviously, we want to reduce the amount of oh, VMware. OK, fine. So when we use a file server, holds, it, it's not normal behavior. You know, we shouldn't really be impacting anything on there. Obviously, uh, RDS tends to be quite reliable for us. Um, Maybe that's something we could take offline. Um, so feel free to email me on that one. Uh, I don't see particular issues with backing up RDS. Um, I'm not sure if you mean the RDS. I'm assuming you mean the RDS management servers. OK. And Durais, you're saying, will Nag uh, Dagnode be sold with Update 3 Cluster Aware Backup? So yes, we have Cluster Aware feature sets being announced in Update 3. It's in beta. It hasn't been released yet. It's only for the internal guys. So I've heard good news that the cluster uh, support mode is working very well, uh, Durais. So Update 3, the Cluster Aware functionality there apparently is looking very, very sexy indeed. So hopefully that will support any DAG queries you have around around that. Um, I think the questions are drying up now, guys. Thank you for all the, the comments uh, of thanks. Um, much appreciated. Uh, just going to scroll back down here to the bottom, make sure we haven't left anyone else out. Philip, I think we, oh, yeah, no, thank you as well. Right, I think that concludes it, guys. So um, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. And we'll leave it here, guys. And thank you very much. Great talking to you all.